Hi, this is A History of Ancient Philosophy. I'm Mark Dorsby, and in this video we'll be looking at Aristotle's Metaphysics, and in particular we'll be looking at excerpts from Book 7, uh, which is a pretty, sort of at the very core, the center of Aristotle's Metaphysics. So let me start with some brief preliminary ideas before we begin taking a look at the text. Uh, the first sort of thing is you're going to see in this video, I'm going to be actually looking at the text very, very closely. Uh, but you're going to see, for those of you who have been reading along, that it really is necessary if you're going to understand Aristotle's metaphysics. Uh, I was sort of, um, when I first, before I began recording this video, I was looking at what I asked, what I had assigned, what I had assigned for the reading, and I noticed that I only had 15 pages. Uh, but once I started reviewing it and reading it again, I, re I remembered why I only assigned 15 pages. And that's because Aristotle's text here is incredibly dense. Um, but it's not incomprehensible. And so I'm certain that for those of you who are reading Aristotle for the first time, you're having difficulty. Um, but keep working with it. It's a really uh, rewarding text. So some general remarks before we begin is, first off, remember that metaphysics for Aristotle is first philosophy. And when we say it's first philosophy, it means that Aristotle is trying to uncover, if he can, right, uh, the science of being qua being. That is, what does, it, what does being itself mean? Um, right, uh, philosopher Martin Heidegger in the 20th century calls this the, the question of being. Um, so that is, how can we understand the causes and the principles that undergird existence itself? Right, um, it's first because all of the other sciences depend upon this question or at least they depend substantially on their being. Uh, uh, all the other sciences are, in fact, cases of being. And this is the science that tries to look at all of them universally. So the core issue in Book 7 here is really centered around this question of what exactly a primary substance is. And if you haven't watched our earlier videos, you really should go back and, and remind yourself and review uh, because you're going to see that we're going to begin in this video really deep at the heart of the um, of the text. Uh, but a couple things is remember a substance refers to a this, right? So for instance, I have a, a glass of water here, um, and there's a thisness to it, and that's what he's talking about when he asks what primary substance is. Because remember that the what we see around us is what is existing that is all of these things have being um, and if we're going to understand what being is we have to begin with that which is a this um, so we're looking at primary being um, if in again take a look at the physics and the categories um, where aristotle really lays out sort of the fundamental sort of concepts that we'll be working with in this video um, so the sort of one of the things he's going to be looking at is but there's a lot of different ways in which we talk about things having existence. And we talk about a lot of different things that have existence. So for instance, consider the fact if I say, the cup is green and cold, right? Um, what it, there's a lot of different ways in what we're saying, right? So the cup is, I'm sorry, the cup is sort of green or blue, and, and green from one angle, blue from another, but the cup is blue, right? Blueness exists in some sense, but, but it seems somehow independent of the thisness of the cup, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways um, in which we talk about things having existence. Um, and so what Aristotle really wants to do in this section is try to see if he can clarify uh, the attributes, the types of ways in which we talk about these things. So you're actually going to see that in this text, and in, in Aristotle's text primarily, you're going to see he sort of interlaces a dialogue about A, what we can know, B, how we can know it, right, um, concerning the language we can use, uh, I'm sorry, the, the senses we can use, and then third, how we can talk about something, that is the language we have. So Aristotle is doing a lot of different things simultaneously throughout this text. So one of the other big questions he's going to be looking at is, what is the relationship of matter and form in substances? And just to remind you, every being, right, ha every substance, and I'm going to use that term being, lowercase b, synonymous with substance because the actual term that Aristotle uses again 
actually originally just means being. Uh, we translated it as substance today um, to help keep it all clear for ourselves. Um, but every substance is, has both form and matter, right? So the cup has matter. It's made of something, in this case, plastic. But it also has form. It has a certain sort of shape to it. Um, but the form doesn't exist without the matter, and the matter doesn't exist without the form, at least not in the sense of there being imminent parts of reality, right? We can logically distinguish the matter and the form, and we're going to see here that Aristotle is going to talk quite a bit about the relationship between matter and form, ultimately coming to the conclusion that substance is form um, at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> of course, and he's going to look at the question of well, what is essence exactly, um, because it looks like the essence of something is the same thing as its form, uh, but they have a complicated, nuanced relationship. Also, he's going to ask is can a thing be distinct from its essence? I sort of put on here the answer is no, uh, but we'll see why um, as we go through the text. Um, we're also he also raised the question well, what exactly is a definition? What are we doing when we try to define things? So, for instance. He comes up with a very fascinating result, which is even though in metaphysics we're looking at, we want to know what makes this, this, right, the being of imminent reality, um, we don't define the imminent. We only define the universal, right? Um, so uh, it's going to be sort of interesting here because it means that particulars, right, remember going all the way back to Plato, we can distinguish between universals and particulars. A universal concept would be like human. Um, and then me as an individual, you as an individual, we would be particulars. And one of the things he talks about here is that the particulars can't be defined, um, only the universals can. Um, this is going to lead us to a really interesting and difficult spot in Aristotle's metaphysics, and that if you're a fine reader, you'll see that it's sort of inconsistent, or at least it's not altogether clear what Aristotle's arguing. So we're going to be talking about the universals and substances quite quite a bit. In fact, I can just mention, actually, if I go back here, um, that this problem of universals actually takes up a huge amount of literature in, in the philosophy of the Middle Ages, uh, which is quite fascinating. Today, it seems a bit obtuse and absurd, but um, maybe I'm being a bit dismissive there, but um, there is an interesting discussion that you may want to look at in further as you further your research on your own. Um, Another question here is, is substance a sort of principle or cause? Uh, and the answer is going to be yes. Of course, by the end of this book, we're not going to exactly know what, what kind or why. Um, but he is going to argue that primary substance is something like a principle. Oh, there's nothing there. So we're done looking at this. So what I want to do now is jump right into the text. Um, um, and so I have to apologize because I know that for many of you, the, this will immediately become a bit boring. Uh, but that's just the nature, it, not to say that Aristotle is boring, but uh, the nature of this philo of these discussions in philosophy are such that they're highly, um, I don't want to say theoretical, but they're highly abstract. Uh, so it really requires a lot of um, close attention. I encourage you as you're reading, uh, I encourage you as you're watching this video to actually have the text with you. Again, we're using the ancient Greek of philosophy from Thales to um, Aristotle by Hackett, um, published by Hackett. Uh, but you can read along. You can see here's the, the universal pagination you can follow along with. But I encourage you to read the text, pause the video, and sort of follow along that way. Um, otherwise, it could be, you could very easily sort of fall into the abyss of just being like, wait a second, what are we talking about again? Um, so take your time with this text. It's a rewarding text, but only if you take your time with it, um, or at least I have to take my time. So you may be better off than I am, a better reader than I am, but I find this incredibly difficult to actually um, discuss and to lecture about. But that's because what Aristotle is trying to do here is incredibly difficult to talk about. Um, so there's a reason it's difficult here, and that's because this is, again, first philosophy for an Aristotle sense, being quad being. Okay. Let's jump into it. Enough of these sort of preliminary remarks. And you'll see what I've done here, just as a reminder, is I've um, um, I've highlighted sort of what I think are sort of crucial passages. I literally have to highlight them in my book, and I've just transferred the highlighted notations onto the text. And I just sort of want to go 
follow Aristotle through here um, in terms of kind of pointing out what I think are some of the key moments in the text. Uh, let me do one thing. I want to pause it for just a sec. Okay, so let's jump right in here. And the first sort of thing to notice is Aristotle begins simply by saying being is spoken of in many ways. And we I just remarked on that as well, um, right? And he says uh, there's lots of different ways in which we talk about beings. And so we've got to first clarify, if you will, our language. And so I think what we might say is that the very beginning here is we have a lexiconal difficulty here, which is namely um, we have to disentangle whoops, sorry we have to disentangle the way in which our words get related to each other you'll recall and i'm going to begin just from the beginning here you'll recall in a two videos ago when we we're looking at aristotle's categories aristotle talked about the idea that there's such a thing as words can be homonymous meaning that they can have the same name but have different definitions um so uh, i mean a sort of silly an easy example here would be to think of the word man Right, man can refer to a male, or man can, in some contexts, refer to human beings. Right, all human beings. Um, that's an example where they have the same term, different definitions. Um, the reason this is an important distinction, and the reason we had you look at the reason Aristotle mentions this in the categories, is because, or we, the reason we read it first, was because being is just like this. Uh, we mean a whole bunch of different things using um, one word. When we talk about being, we have to disentangle them philosophically to figure out what is simply related to the account, right? And which ones are related to the actual metaphysics themselves. So what we might call, and Aristotle doesn't use this terminology, but what we might call the ontology, right, um, of reality, right? Ontological um, uses of being. So being is spoken of in many ways. He says it's evident that among these primary beings, is the what it is, and that's what signifies substance. So you might just say this, is that, um, is that being is, uh, primary being is the answer to the question, what is something? Um, and we're going to see in today's video that, or in Aristotle's text here, that that thing ultimately concerns the substance's form, right? But we're jumping a bit here. He says, a little bit further, he says, but since substance is primary in every way, in nature, in account, and in knowledge. Let me disentangle that for you. Um, I think this is really important here because he's talking about the idea that we can talk about substance in terms of its nature, right? In terms of its ontology. That's what I mean by ontological there. In terms of its, oops, its nature. Or in terms of the account, right? That is, uh, the nature of how we can explain something. And also in terms of our knowledge of something. Um, so this is sort of important. We're going to see that as we disentangle the ways in which we talk about being, we talk about it in terms of its reality, in terms of its nature, in terms of our way of understanding it, and also in terms of what can be known. Um, now, he goes on to, well, pardon me, I keep doing that. Um, he goes on to, to then say, um, for instance, and so we too make it our main, our primary, indeed practically, our only task to study what it is in this way. We want to know what being is in terms of its substantial nature, in terms of its nature, but we're going to have to understand a whole bunch here about the account as well. So let me move forward here. Okay, so he says first and foremost when we're thinking about primary substance, it's most evident, primary substances are most evident in terms of their being bodies, or them in terms of their having bodies, right? Think of the example I gave you here a little earlier with the cup. The cup is a neat example because I can point to it because it has a body of some sort. And by body, I think we can just mean it's, it exists in space, really. Um, so the first sort of thing is when we think about primary sense, we can think about that. And that's going to raise a question ultimately about matter. But we're going to see, though, that Aristotle has a more complicated understanding. He thinks, again, this is related to his the method of his inquiry, is he's starting with what is most obvious to us, and trying to move from that to what is even better known philosophically, uh, right? So he says, he says but, but wait a second, for instance, some, he says, mention, he mentions the idea that uh, some think that there are no substances apart from perceptible things, 
while to others it seems that there are also everlasting substances. So you're going to see here when we talk about the question of substances, we have to ask, can there be such a thing? There's obviously substances that have bodies, but can there be everlasting substances? Um, and here we should, in the context of our broader course and in, in dialogue with Plato, right? Plato thinks that um, the forms are everlasting and that the forms are what have being in their most principal sense. Um, so Plato is over here, right? And that's what he means when he says that some, right, think that there are no substances apart from perceptual things, while others seem to think that there are everlasting substances. He's sort of saying there's materialist, and then there's also people like Plato who, who argue, or Pythagoras, who argue that there are other things that are everlasting and non-perceptible. So, and, and here this is important, if we take the language away from Aristotle, we can say that when we talk about this question of being and beings, there's some beings we can see, some beings we can perceive, but it seems like there must be beings that we can't see, right? These are not perceptible, these are not seen. Um, and so it raises a sort of interesting question here. How can we have knowledge about that which we can't see? Um, now, you can see here, he then goes to, Aristotle then goes to talk about forms and mathematics. He's clearly um, having a, a dialogue in reference to Plato here. Um, but you can see these are the top contenders, mathematics and these ideal objects. Think of the Pythagorean theorem, right? Think about the idea that the Pythagorean theorem, even when the, uni the sun goes supernova, the Pythagorean theorem will still be true, right? Um, so that seems to indicate that there's something, um, there's something more to being than simply what our eyes can let us see. We're, we frequently talk about Aristotle as being an empiricist to a certain degree. That is, he thinks that our knowledge does begin with the experience. But you're going to see there, he doesn't think that our knowledge ends with experience. And that's a a, a big point of departure from modern British empiricism or something like this, uh, which is pretty important. Uh, so, but you can see here that the first sort of section of the book, really, he just sort of raises these questions and says, well, we've got to drill down and understand. I think the real key thing from this first section is to, to see how he differentiates what I'm calling the lexiconal difficulty into the account, into the nature, and into knowledge. Okay, so let's jump into three here. Um, and, he's, and Aristotle says, substance is spoken of, if not in several ways, at any rate in four cases, right? For the essence, the universal, and the genus seem to be the substance of a you know, given thing. And the fourth of these cases is the subject, right? Um, so let me move over my text here, right? Um, so you can see here, the idea here is that substance seems to be given in its essence. Substance seems to be given in the universal, it seems to be given in the genus and also in the, su in the subject, right? So there's lots of different ways in which subs um, substance can be spoken of. But we're going to see that Aristotle doesn't think, he does not think, that substance is reducible to all of these things, right? For instance, he's going to eventually argue that substance is the species, not the genus. Um, and think about the, the problem that I'm, th of thisness, right? The problem that... Um, you could say that this cup, particular cup, is a species of a broader category of things we call cups, right? Um, our knowledge of cups are universal. We generally know what cups are. Um, but uh, the, sub the primary substance is never those things. It's this thing, right? Um, so you can see it gets sort of complicated here. And he's just beginning by sort of laying out the possibilities, right? He says what it is, since the primary substance seems to be, I'm sorry, what is spoken of in this way as the primary substance is in one way the matter, in another way the form, and in a third it's the composite, right? And so here we will just sort of draw our sort of quick cheat sheet, right? You can see here that substance for him has matter and it has form, uh, but it ultimately seems to be the composite that's the substance. Now I'm not saying that's what he says it is, uh, but he's raising the question here is, there's sort of three different things that we've got to disentangle regarding substances. Oops, keep doing that. Uh, let's move ahead. Right, and he says, and so if we study it from this point of view, the result is that matter is substance, but this is actually impossible, right? And what he's going on here is he's talking about the idea is that 
because of what I'm the language I'll use here is the imminence of, of substance right because it's this thing right our first sort of our first sort of thought is probably well maybe the primary substance is the actual matter it's what it's made of but Aristotle actually rejects this uh, for a number of different reasons um, but he would one of the reasons for instance is the idea that well matter is something that's actually totally unknown to me, right? Um, because the only way that I know that this is different than something else is because it's a, it has a certain different type of arrangement, right? And it has an arrangement of what? Of matter, right? But the problem here is that matter, um, right, in and of itself, right, matter without form is incomprehensible. Um, all matter has form uh, and so matter in and of itself is unintelligible i can't even talk about it because i don't even know what i'm talking about um, if that makes sense um, because every time i do talk about something i understand it in terms of its form so for instance let's take an example here um, take the example of a circle right let's say that there's a circle and this is our substance well, a circle can be made up of anything, but the way in which I know that something is a circle is actually by its form, that is by its structure, right? Not its matter. Now, but it's clear though, um, conversely, that a particular circle does have a specific type of matter, right, to it. So matter can't be primary substance because we can't say anything about it, right? What we can say is that matter is a necessary element for substantial form because you can't have form without matter um, so again these are just logically logical distinctions for aristotle right the substance is what is what's real right the matter and the form is just our way of distinguishing and giving an account of the form of the substance i'm sorry okay again i can tell just as i'm talking through this that this stuff is incredibly difficult to understand um, so take it, you know, a lot of times you just got to stop, pause the video, and just think these things through and read the text really closely, right? Okay, so let's jump to section four here. Aristotle says, since we began by distinguishing the things by which we define substances, and since essence seems to be one of these, we ought to study it. So you might say that section four is really about the question of essence. What exactly is an essence? Um, now, notice here that... Um, we can we can we, we can make the distinction between essence versus existence right something exists but what exists always is known by um, things which are unique to it right that's that is not just unique in the sense that they just happen to be that way but unique and necessary to the thing um, so for instance think about the united states of america and we have a constitutional system of a, a particular type of constitutional system. And so you can say that the, our constitutional system is our essence, right? Is the essence of the American project, if you will, of the United States. Um, its existence is rather what's happening, right? Uh, so essence is an answer to the question of what something is. So you see there's a relationship here between essence and form. And one of the questions that Aristotle is going to try to figure out is what exactly is the relationship between these two is the essence just the form um, it, because it doesn't seem like I use the language of form at always always at the same time right there are some cases in which that I seem to have a better sense of an essence but not so much a form um, you know in terms of substantial form and here you can think about beings which are only known through intellection they're only known by the mind um, beings that aren't known through perception um, so it's much more difficult to articulate the form in that sense um, and we're going to see here that really these two things do refer to the same thing um, but that um, he's just trying to be crystal clear on the language which ironically the the clearer we try to make it it's as if um, the more obscure it becomes uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein 20th century philosopher has a great phrase where he talks about the idea that um, the greater the logical purity, it's like slippery ice, right? And his quote is, back to the rough ground. So uh, it's sort of an interesting question here to think about. Anyway, the essence of thing is what is said to be in its own right. 
Okay, so the essence of a substance is what is um, essential without qualification to the thing we're talking about, right? Um, it is not coincidental. So let's write that down. It's not coincidental. So for instance, let's take for instance, Aristotle uses the example of a, a person who's pale, right? So it's a, when I see a person who's pale, right, paleness is not essential to the person, right? Because they can also not be pale, right? They could have be red in the face or something like this, right? So there are different features of substances um, that are not in their essence. Um, and so he has to distinguish, we have to, uh, that is, we have to art, be able to articulate the limiting principle between these two things. Um, and it has to be something, the essence is what is without qualification, an essential necessary element of that thing, right? Okay, so let's take a look here. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> I hate it. Sometimes I lose control of my screen. Um, okay. <sighs> He says, it follows that the account of a thing's essence is the account that, descri that describes but does not mention the thing. So if being a pale surface is the same as being a smooth surface, being pale and being smooth are one and the same. Now, he's not arguing that paleness and smoothness are the same, right? He's just giving you an example. And the example is simply to say, right, that... Um, that um, the account, the essence, is the account that describes but does not mention the thing, right? Um, you can see the difficulty here is that Aristotle's language is actually precise, um, yet and hence it's difficult. He goes on to say that hence we should ask whether there is an account of the essence of each of these composites or whether an essence belongs to them, to a pale man, for instance, as well as a substance. And so here what I think I take it that Aristotle is asking the question is, okay, if we're going to talk about essence, right, we can talk about things in their own right, things in their intrinsic sense, right? Um, and that's, so for instance, that would be the, and, the, and there we're saying something which isn't used to describe itself, right? Uh, but we can also talk about things having composite natures, like a pale man. And so one of the questions here is, does pale man have an essence and does man have an essence, right? Um, there's two different types. Clearly, the type of essence he's interested in is the intrinsic essence. Um, but this is an important sort of question because <coughs> if composites do have essence, then what is their relationship to primary being, right? He says there are two ways in which we speak of what is not in its own right. One way is from addition and the other is not. So when we talk about something that is not in its own right, we're either adding characteristics together or we're negating characteristics or we're negating some characteristics. So when I say the man is pale, I'm adding the concept of paleness to the man, right? So here the idea is the concept man has essence, the concept of pale has a sort of essence, and I'm combining them through addition, right? Um, and I can also do this in other ways by negating different features. Um, so, for instance, you could say, um, well, I can't think of a good example, so I'm not going to come up with them. I usually find that when I just make them up, they're bad. Uh, but, um, but there are other examples. I'll just keep going here since we're already running at 28 minutes. So, um, later on, a little bit later, he says, hence the things that have an essence are those whose account is a definition. Okay, this and now we're starting to get somewhere here, right? So something has an essence if that essence, um, right, ha can be given in a definition, right? So it's a sort of important here, right? The essence concerns the nature and the definition concerns the account. Notice how in the beginning when he distinguishes between our knowledge, the account, um, and nature, this is part of the way in which he's trying to organize our language. Oops, okay. Um, I accidentally moved that. Okay, um, so the essence concerns the definition, if there's an essence. And by the way, the answer to the question here for Aristotle is composites do not have essences. Um, composites don't have essences because if they did, 
then that would lead us actually into a regression problem because then we'd have to say, um, well, you have to begin by understanding something in order to create composites. And if essences, if composites can have essences, then it, it would create a sort of a feedback problem where I'd have to understand another to understand another to understand another, right? So he doesn't think that's the case. Why? Because ultimately he's concerned with reality, with the imminent substance, right? The this. Um, and so um, definitions um, are subsidiary to the essence, right? Um, an account is a definition only if it is some primary thing. Um, so that's really important here, right? So the account is only if it's some primary thing. Um, it can't be just any old thing. Here you have to consider or disentangle the idea of things being primary, right? That is essential and necessary versus things being accidental. Okay, uh, let's keep moving here. Okay, jumping down here, Aristotle says, we must certainly consider what ought to be said about a particular question. We must consider no less how things really are. Um, that actually dovetails on what I just said, right? Which is namely that, yeah, 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 we can talk in different ways about something, but what we have to ultimately articulate is the way things are. And so this is an important thing. Aristotle doesn't use this language, but I think it's quite helpful here is we can distinguish between the real versus the nominal. Um, the nominal, uh, the word nominal actually refers to the idea of names and how we name things, right? Whereas what's real refers to how things are. Um, and the key here philosophically is we're ultimately concerned with this, not with this. I mean, we have to understand the nominal so that because we use words and language to talk about what is, to talk about the real. But it's the real that we take our clue from, not the language, right? Um, that's why I was saying earlier that if the essence, I'm sorry, the definition is subsidiary to the essence because the definition concerns our account. Um, okay, let's keep, let's jump back into it here. Let's see here. So we must find that essence, like what it is, belongs primarily and without qualification to substance and belongs derivatively to other things, right? So that is, um, there's a primary substance, what it, right? These primary substances are what have the essence, right? But the essence gets, if you will, applied to other things, right? So um, man gets applied to pale man, for instance. Um, so again, we have to stick with the real, uh, and that's sort of an important point. Now, there's a whole range of modern philosophical questions of epistemology here that Aristotle doesn't answer uh, that would certainly um, injure his, uh, his speculative philosophy here. Um, that might be an insult for some, but anyway. He says, it doesn't matter which alternative, except in either case, substances evidently have a definition and an essence of the primary type, right? A def Because keep in mind, we can have definitions of pale man and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we can have lots of different definitions, but every essence will have a definition of its primary thing, right? Uh, but that primary thing is a definition and an essence without qualification, Certainly other beings and definitions have emphasis, but not primarily. So the only kinds of definitions we're interested in are definitions which concern primary substances and definitions which are primary themselves, right? Uh, they're um, central, right? Uh, and here he gives this example. One type of being signifies of this. I only highlighted this because I wanted you to, to see again that we're talking about the thisness of reality, if you will. Um, a little bit later here, he says, for instance, what about a substance of the sort, say, an idea is, right? So this is an interesting question, which is namely an idea. Are ideas substances exactly? Uh, because remember, he doesn't constrict um, his metaphysics to matter, right? It's also things which are intelligible, intelligible have existence, right? Think about the idea of the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That idea exists when you think it, right? So is that idea itself a type of substance? Um, and by the way, you can see there's a big resonance here with the question of Plato. Because Plato thinks that at the end of the day, the 
the only beings which really have being are ideas. So a lot's at stake here for Plato and for Aristotle's understanding of Plato, but there's a lot at stake for us too, because we're constantly, as philosophers, because we're using these concepts all the time, are these concepts beings in their own way, right? Uh, which is because they sort of are, but they're sort of not, right? They are because when I'm thinking those cons ideas, they exist, but they're not because when I'm not thinking them, who knows where they are, right? I mean, in fact, that's what Aristotle himself will actually say a little bit later on. But let me jump back into it. He says, if then the ideas and the essences are severed from each other, right? If we separate the essence and the ideas from each other, then it follows that the ideas will not be known and the essences will not be things. Okay, what is Aristotle talking about here, right? So he's talking about this idea that we have ideas and there's essences, right? Um, and primary beings have essences, we know that. Now, it seems here that what if we separate them, right? Could it be the case that essences are distinct from ideas? And he's going to say that doesn't make any sense because if ideas are separate from their essence, then what happens is your idea doesn't give you knowledge, right? Because there is no, because the essence is what's linked to the primary being, right? Linked to substance. Let me just write that. Right? But if you sever, if you separate logically ideas from essences, then ideas can actually give you knowledge. Right? That's why it says it follows that the ideas will not be known. And it follows that the essences will not be things. Right? Because you have ideas of things. Um, and so you can see here what it means is that ideas and essences have to be the same. Uh, they have to be the same. And what he wants to argue here is that substances have essences, and that's where our ideas come from. Um, at least that's how I'm interpreting um, Aristotle. Later he says, For we know a thing whenever we recognize its essence. Further, what applies to good, here he has to be thinking of Plato, right? Further, what applies to good applies equally to the other essences. If the essence of the good is not good, then neither will the essence be of being B nor the essence of one be one. And you can see here, he's giving this example that if you separate essences and ideas, the whole thing starts to degrade um, and decay, right? So for, if this is true, that is, i.e. that something is a primary being, it already implies that the primary being is identical to its essence, even if it's not its form, though presumably, the conclusion is all the more necessary if the thing is a form. Whoops. Okay, we move on here. I hope this is helpful, and I hope you're getting something out of this. Um, okay, next sort of here at 20, he says, For these arguments, then, we find that a thing itself and its essence are not coincidentally one and the same, and that knowing a thing is knowing its essence, and so even isolating the form shows a thing, um, shows that a thing in its essence must be some one thing, right? So what is he what is he saying, right? Is that when we talk about a substance, right? And a substance has essence, and a substance an essence has a form, right? All of these are one. All of these are one thing actually, right? And they're not one coincidentally, right? Now remember, what do we mean by coincidentally? Think about the idea, I'm a, I'm a human, and let's imagine I go outside and it's cold, right? Then I'm a cold human, right? Um, but I'm only a cold human. At, at that one moment, I'm a cold human. But coldness and humanness are only one in a coincidental sense, right? It just happens to be the case that it's like that. That's not what he's talking about here, right? A substance is one with its essence and its form, necessarily right those things are always together now why is he um, saying this and insisting upon this i think it goes back to the idea that he's trying to articulate a science of being right um, we want to understand what's necessarily the case about being so as to understand the necessary principles and causes for existence and we haven't really got there yet but here we can see here that He's articulating the way in which things can be unified metaphysically or ontologically. Right? <clears throat> he says that, for instance, we can also see that it's absurd 
for something not to be the same as its essence if we give a name to each essence, right? Um, you can imagine here that if we started giving names to essences um, as opposed to the forms, we would it would be absurd. It wouldn't make any sense, right? Um, there's a certain form of humanness that is for, consider the fact that you can go anywhere in the world, right? I can drop you off in the Congo. I can drop you off in the Mongolian desert, and you're going to be you're going to see people who you've never seen before, who would all likely look different from you, different skin, hair, features, language, all that sort of thing. But you're going to recognize that they're humans, and you're going to recognize they're humans because they seem to have the same form, the same shape, right? They have limbs and arms, but more importantly, they have the same form of living. Right? They reason and they think, right? And they can make arguments, etc., etc., right? Um, you're going to recognize that these other people are um, humans, right? And you don't have to give a different name to the essence in the form here. They've referred to the same thing, right? Um, so why? Because they're univocal, if you will, because they're ontologically unified. They're ontologically one. Right, so a thing and its essence are one and the same, right? And and that was probably clear from the beginning, right? Maybe, but you can see here how Aristotle really wants to make sure that he's on solid footing. And he says so. For it's evident that the sophistical refutations aimed against this position all revolved in the same way as is the puzzle of whether Socrates and being Socrates are the same, right? So you can ask that question, right? Um, um, is Socrates the same as being Socrates? And the answer is, that's an absurd question, of course, right? Um, because essence refers to the same thing, right? The thing and its essence are one and the same. You can see here, notice, since he's linking up form here, matter, again, as we said, is this unintelligible stuff that's sort of necessary, but off to the side, um, right? <coughs> Now, Aristotle in this section 10, he starts to raise some interesting questions. Um, and he goes into the, goes a little bit deeper into the question of what a definition is. Um, and he says, for instance, every definition is an account, right? So every time I give, have a definition, I'm giving an account of something, right? I'm giving some form of explanation, right? And every account has parts, right? Every account has parts, right? So think, for instance, if I give the definition of a bachelor, right? A bachelor is an unmarried male, right? In that case, I'm giving you, I'm giving parts of my account in order to give you the definition, right? So there's an interesting here, a, a relationship between the parts and the whole, right? Because it looks like I have to use the parts to define the whole. The whole here is the concept of bachelor, and the parts is the unmarried male part. I'll just put unmarried and male, right? Um, so you have the parts and the whole. So Aristotle is now sort of wants to understand what is the relationship between the parts and the whole. This is actually known as the problem of emergence in contemporary philosophy. That is, how is it that the whole comes from the parts? And here there's an interesting question. Is think about the idea that you... As a human being, right, I'm assuming you're human, right, you have arms, legs, you're made up of bones and flesh, right, and sinews and all this cartilage and all this stuff, right, but those are all just parts of you, right, you as a whole are in a certain way irreducible to the parts, despite being the fact that you are composed of the parts, and so this is important why, because as we look to the question of what an essence is, and we know that an essence can be given through a definition, we have to understand the relationship here of how the parts, because parts are of other things, how the parts explain the whole or don't explain the whole, um, and whether or not a substance can even be said to be one thing at all, right? Um, and he's going to argue it should be, and we're going to see why here in just a moment. So he says, a puzzle arises about whether or not the account of the parts must be present in the account of the whole. In fact, he says, though, However, the whole seems to be prior since the account of the part refers to the whole and the whole is prior to being independent. Okay, whoa, what is he saying there, right? So let's think of it this way. Um, he gives an example of a circle here, which is quite instructive, right? A circle can have a primary substance, but what are the parts of a circle? The problem here is that a circle is what? 
a circle is made up of an infinite amount of points, right? Um, there's an infinite amount of points. So the parts don't tell you about the circle, right? The circle is really something like the composition of the parts. That is, it's the form of the parts, right? And the, and the circle is independent of the parts, right? Um, because just a whole bunch of points doesn't make it a circle. Um, <clears throat> well, here, let me give you these. Let me read you what he says, right? For in some cases, the accounts of the parts evidently are present, and in some cases, they're evidently not. The account of a circle, for instance, does not include that of the segments, right? Because there's an infinite number of segments. So, but the, that's what I meant by point. But the account of a syllable includes that of the letters, even though the circle is divided into its segments, just as the syllable is divided into its letters, right? So he's sort of saying here is some things um, seem to have, and for some things, you can't really even know what the parts are, um, right? It would be weird to say that you have to know the parts to understand the whole. And there's other things which seem much more closely related to their parts, like syllables and letters and things like this. And ultimately, though, what he wants to argue here is that the whole is prior to the parts, right? So when we talk about this idea of parts versus wholes, he thinks that at the end of the day, the whole is what has logical priority, right? Um, and this is really important for him because the essence is related to the whole. It's not related to the part, right? Um, and our goal is to gain knowledge of the whole, right? So a geometer wants to learn about circles and triangles. They don't want to just learn about what those things are made up of, right? Lines and segments and points, right? Because of the independence of the whole, the whole has logical priority, and that's what's linked to the essence, not the part. Uh, because you can see if you go over here, if you went the reverse direction, then you end up with a whole range of problems, potentially. Right? He says, in one way, matter is also called a part of something, but in another way, it's not. And so, and so here's where we, we can sort of see that in one way, matter is what, is what we're composed of, but in another way, it's not. Right? He says, for if a line is divided and perishes into halves, or a man into bone, sinews, and bits of flesh, it doesn't follow that those compose the whole as parts of the substance, but only that they compose it as matter, right? So think about the idea that when I die, unfortunately I will, right? When I die, when you die, our bodies will degrade and they'll decompose, right? And they'll, co right? And they'll compose into different pieces, literally. It's sort of disgusting, actually, right? But those pieces, if you just piled those pieces up into a, 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 um, a heap, that would not be a person, right? That would just be a bunch of flesh, right? And his idea here is that you would say that the parts are just um, parts of the matter, right? The matter itself is not the part, right? So that's the way in which they're not the same. Uh, but in another colloquial sense, certainly we can see that, that the, it does seem to be matter. So you can see here there's it, the, dif whoops, the difficulty of Aristotle's account, again, is in the fine-tuned distinctions he's trying to give here in order ultimately to specify this thing we call substance, being, right? So hence, the account of some thing will include that of these material parts, but the account of other things, if it's not something combined with matter, must not include it. For this reason, the principles composing a given thing are, in some but not all cases, the material parts in which they perish, right? So keep in mind the, the, the idea of ideas, right? An idea, right, the Pythagorean theorem here, it's not made up of matter that degrades, right? Uh, so he says, so if something is without matter, not combined with it so that its account is only of the form, right? And think when I say a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I'm giving you a mathematical formulation, a form, right? Um, but it doesn't perish, either not at all or at least not in this way, right? And so you can see here that things which are known really through the intellect, beings which are known through the intellect, they don't perish in the same way that things which are composed of matter do. Um, they may, they may, right? So you can ask the question, for instance, if the, when the sun goes supernova and all the human beings are extinguished out of the universe, will the Pythagorean theorem still exist? And in a certain way, maybe, in a certain way, who knows, right? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, because without us to articulate it, uh, you know, they don't, 
it doesn't decompose in the same way, but it's hard to know if it still exists. Um, so that's sort of an interesting sort of prelude here, right? So he then goes to talk about the idea that when we talk about animals, for instance, the soul of an animal is the substance, right? The, or he says the substance of what is in soul is the animal's soul, and it, it's what corresponds. It's what the substance corresponds to the account. It is the form and the essence of the right sort of body. At any rate, a proper definition of each part requires reference to its function. <laughs> and function requires perception. Okay, so this is sort of interesting, right? So we have a substance, and a substance has essence, and the essence is known through an account, right? And the account is given by a definition, right? And the definition is given by parts. Okay, I'm just sort of laying it out for you, right? These parts are individuated by understanding the function of each of these parts, and the function is given through perception, right? That is the only way I know what the function of the parts are is to observe those functions taking place, right? So the heart, the function of the heart is what? To move blood around the circulatory system here, right? Um, the, or I, I'm not the biologist and botanist, so maybe I'm wrong about my language here, right? But the heart moves all the blood around. But the only way we know that is by what? By perceiving the heart, right? <laughs> that is by cutting open your vein and seeing it squirt out in a regular rhythm, right? Suddenly we begin to understand what the function of the heart is. It's through perception. Um, so this is sort of an important element um, related to his epistemology or his sort of empirical um, drive. So a proper digestion of each part requires reference to its function, and this function requires perception. Let me keep going here. Sorry about that. Okay. The body and its parts are posterior to the substance, i.e. the soul, and its parts are the matter into which uh, the compound, but not the substance, is divided. Okay. Now, what is he saying here, right? Is he saying that the parts of me and the body and the matter, all of that stuff is ultimately posterior. That is, it's secondary to what? For him, the soul. Now, the soul is nothing other than the essence of, and it's going to be nothing other than the substantial form of a person or an animal in this case he gives right so he says but but contrast this right so for instance man or horse or anything else that applies to this way to particulars but universally is not a substance and this is going to raise an interesting question for us later you'll see where aristotle seems to contradict or have a different interpretation right they take for instance the concept of man and the concept of horse right these refer to things universally, right? This word concept refers to humans universally, and this refers to a certain species of animals universally, right? Um, because, but because it's universal, it doesn't apply to a particular this, right? Let's put this. These are both universal, or they have universal import, but that means that they're not particular they're not particulars, which means they're not a this, right? Um, right. So the concept of man it, or human it applies to everyone, every human being, which means that it can't apply to any one and only one particular this, right? Um, so that means that the concepts themselves, these universals, doesn't look like they can be primary substances, um, because how could they be? Uh, because the primary substance is precisely that which has a sort of imminent substance, substantial reality to it, okay? And he says, when it has departed from actual thought or perception, it's unclear whether or not it exists, right? The matter is unknowable in its own right, right? One sort of matter is perceptible, another is intelligible. So when we talk about matter, right, and we talk about the distinction between matter and form, so one type of matter is matter which can be perceived we can say matter by perception, right? And then another type of matter is matter by intellect, matter by thought. Um, and so this is a really important distinction because we're, he's not committed to the idea that every substance has to have matter that's perceptible, right? And by the way, for those of you who are, who are watching this thinking, oh God, Aristotle again, it's this ancient archaic stuff, but it's not totally archaic. 
Think about the idea of um, a dark energy, or dark, dark energy, or dark matter, I should say, really, right? Um, this is a, something that physicists say exists, but they say we can never perceive it in principle, right? Well, how do we know it exists? Uh, or how, well, there's a question here, uh, do we really know it exists? But it looks like the only way we can know is by intellect. That is only by deducing that it necessarily exists. So Aristotle doesn't seem to be totally crazy here. You can see here that Aristotle is not a physicalist, right? He doesn't think that everything has to be physical in the same way that we're physical. We have tangible flesh and tangible matter to us, right? Matter doesn't have to be tangible to the senses in order for it to have existence. It can be intelligible. Uh, and so you can see in this regard, Aristotle is very similar to his master, Plato. Now, what sorts of parts are parts of the form and what sorts of parts of the combined thing are of the combined thing and not the form, right? Um, go back to the idea of the pale man, right? Okay, so what part, because if we can talk about the parts of something in terms of giving the definition, so what parts go under the form, the essential form, and what parts are just accidental, coincidental? Um, they go to something that's combined, right? How do we figure that out? He says, you can take this example. Now the form of man, for instance, always appears in flesh and bone, and in parts of this sort, right? So take the form of a human. We gave that example earlier when I drop you off in, Mon um, in um, the desert or something, and you see someone you've never seen before, right? Those parts are always given in a specific, in a specific, in a particular type of matter that is flesh and bones. But now take a look at what Aristotle he says. He says, <coughs> does it follow that these are also parts of the form and the account? Perhaps not. Perhaps they are only matter, and we are incapable of separating them from the form because it does not also occur in other sorts of material parts, right? So it's now you're going to see here that he's not going to actually say this, but so if we take, for instance, the form of human, it looks like the only type of matter that humans have is flesh, flesh and bones, right? But maybe the form, the parts, doesn't have to be the matter. Maybe there can be other types of matter. Right? And so, for instance, think about the idea of could we have human beings inside computers, right? Remember, you've probably seen this, for instance, in science fiction, is could you download a person, right? When a person dies, could you somehow um, scan their mind, maybe even their whole body, and then recreate that body in a virtual space? Uh, that would be an example of having a different type of matter, but having the same form. Um, and, and Aristotle here is saying maybe that is possible. Um, he says, of course, we, we've never seen any other sorts of things. And he actually even says, um, since this sort of thing seems to be possible, but it's unclear when it's possible, right? So he can even, even suggest that yeah, maybe you could have a different type of man or human who isn't composed of flesh because flesh is just a particular type of matter. And we said earlier that the essence is the form. Right? So could you just recreate the form in a downloaded version? So it's sort of interesting here to think about how Aristotle's metaphysics actually in a certain way, um, in a colloquial sense, anticipates a lot of the interesting puzzles we have today. But we're going to see he actually disagrees with this view and he actually doesn't think this. Um, he, and he's going to say, for instance, this sort of position leads to what you might say, what I want to call a metaphysical mathematical reduction of being, right? Let's just put here mathematical reduction. Um, the math mathematical reduction hypothesis. And the hypothesis here would be, well, if something could be composed of its form, right, and not, don't worry about the matter, then that would mean that everything, the form it can always be given in terms of relations of proportionality. Those relations can be symbolized mathematically, which means that at the end of the day, maybe isn't everything just number? After all, isn't this what Pythagoras, right? The, uh, the Pythagorean view here, isn't this what Pythagoras thought? 
right, or the Pythagoreans. And if you watch our earlier video, that's precisely what they thought. Uh, and you can see here, this is also related, not in the same way, but similar to what Plato's talking about. Um, and similar to what Plato's up to, right? Uh, but ultimately, he doesn't think this. Um, let, me hear, let me keep reading here, right? He says, <clears throat> that is why this reduction of everything to numbers and forms in the abstracting of matter goes too far. For presumably, some things are essentially this form in this matter, or these material parts with this form, right? Uh, so he doesn't really, he doesn't give us a final conclusion about humans necessarily, but he does say that it, it seems likely the case that some things are essentially composed of a certain type of thing, right? Because let's take an example here. Let's imagine you could download a person, or, or let's make a different example here. Let's imagine that I scanned you with some computer sci-fi sci device, and I was able to figure out all of the parts of your body, right? And figure out how all the parts work, all the way down to how the neurons fire and all that sort of stuff, right? Let's say I then recreate you. I recreate, I create something made of a machine. It's made up of a robot. Uh, but this robot, every part of the machine is identical uh, in, its, in terms of its form, not in terms of its matter, right? So maybe it's a plastic robot not uh, not uh it's be well let me go back here you create a person who has who's made up of of some sort of machine or mechanism where all of the parts are made up of plastic but has the same form of a human wouldn't we call that person a human right it seems to me that as soon as you take a person and you download them to a computer or you give them a mechanized body they no longer are a human they just resemble a human um, and so you can see here, it seems like mainly there's something necessary and essential to the type of matter we have. Um, so in, he's in, in, this is to, to sort of counter this reductive mathematical hypothesis uh, that just puts all of us into things, right? Um, here's a famous passage here, um, known as the Corsicus and Socrates passage. He says, it's also clear that the soul is the primary substance. The body is matter, and man or animal is composed as two universal, of the two is universal. As for Socrates or Corsicus, if Socrates' soul is also Socrates, he's spoken of in two ways. For, it is, for some speak of him as soul, some as the compound. But if he is without qualification this soul and this body, then what was said about the universal also applies to the particular, right? I um, mean, and then Aristotle says, okay, well, we've got to postpone a bunch of other things that were on our plate when looking at substance, and we've got to continue sort of demarcating this, right? The compound substance has an account in one way, but in another way, it has no account. So remember when we w raised a while back, we raised the question of whether or not a composite has an essence, right? That's the, I think, the pale man example. Does a composite have an essence? Um, we ask that question. And remember, if it, there's an essence, then we can give an account. Uh, but you can see here, he's saying, listen, a compound substance has an account in one way, but in another way, it has no account. Taken together with the matter, it has no account. Uh, since, the, since that is indefinable, matter is indefinable. So the composite of matter with the essence is not it. But it has an account corresponding to the primary substance. Right, um, so so substance is the form that's present in the thing, right? Um, and so let me raise this next sort of point here. Um, Aristotle goes on to say, but if a thing is a substance by being matter or by being combined with matter, it's not the same as the essence. Nor, however, are they one only coincidentally as Socrates and the musical are, for these are the same only coincidentally. So you see again Aristotle making this distinction between um, what is coincidentally one versus what is essentially one. Um, so a substance will be present in the substance. Uh, so, that th so here we get into this notion where Aristotle then begins to talk about the universal. And what you're going to see here is that Aristotle seems to contradict himself. Uh, whereas earlier Aristotle said, 
uh, a substance a universal can't be a substance because it lacks the thisness as i put it right you're going to see he begins to go the other direction all of a sudden and he's going to say he says if we study them in a particular way it's evident that nothing belongs universally as a substance and that what is predicated in common signifies this sort of thing not a this right that's what we said earlier if it's a this then many difficulties result including the third man okay um right because then we would need to give multiple accounts in order to understand something but continue reading and what does aristotle say he says we have found that the compound and the form are different sorts of substances a little bit later for it is the essence of this house not the essence of house that is coming in the process that is in the process of coming to be whereas forms are and are not without any process of coming to be and perishing since we have shown that no one generates or produces them right here roll down here where he talks about this um okay so so what aristotle is he's again you just go with the language close slowly here the next sort of thing is to remember about demonstrations right he says demonstrations and definitions are deductive right they express things that are have to deal with necessity right and he says it clearly follows that there will be neither definition nor demonstration of these particular perceptible things okay wait hold on a second we just said earlier right that um the universal can't be the substance because it doesn't signify this but if we look at it a different way we get suddenly a different sort of result right it looks because you can't actually define a particular you only define the universal the particular in a certain way is the, the imminent thing the this can't be defined right think of the language i'm using here right if you've been watching this video you may have been thinking man when he when the, he says thisness what the hell is he talking about what exactly counts as a this well you can see here i can't give you a definition of this without pointing um because we only define things that correspond to multiple particulars we only co create definitions for universals, right? He says, um, for ideas or particulars. So in the same way that we can't, don't give definitions for people, right? I, I know you're a human, but I don't have to give a definition of you, right? Um, I just have to know the definition of all of us in order to define what you are, right? As a human, that is, right? The same thing goes for ideas, because remember we made the distinction between things matter that's perceptible versus matter that's intelligible um, ideas are intelligible but ideas are particulars right so think about this for instance is i don't if take the concept of horse that's an idea right um, i can give you a definition and uh, to explain what a horse is but i don't define the idea of horse with another idea right to understand i just give an account right i give a, um, a, I give an account through the parts of that essence in order to define it. But the ideas themselves, like think about the think about the the notion of the number sixty three. That's an idea. Does sixty three need its own definition? No, it doesn't. It's in fact rather I understand all of the numbers by understanding them universally. I don't have to give a definition for number sixty three, number sixty two, number sixty one. And they don't have to be different definitions, um, right? Um, so here his idea is that ideas are actually particulars. Now this is important because it means what? It means that ideas have have a sort of thisness. An idea can have a itself can itself be or signify a primary substance, right? Um, that's why we just give names that are common to all. We have a definition for number. We don't have a definition for this particular concept number, right? Um, and so on and so forth. And so he says, so as has been said then, we fail to notice that everlasting things uh, that are particulars are indefinable, <laughs> right? Uh, it's important here, we can't define this stuff. There's a limit to what we can actually say. And this is important metaphysically for him. It's not just a point about the met, the, um, that what we can know. It's not simply an epistemological point of contention. Here Aristotle is making ontological progress by identifying, right, the idea that an idea has a, a degree of thisness, right? He says, but let's make a new beginning and let's start over again, 
right? Um, he says, since then substance is some sort of principle and cause, we should proceed from there, right? That's important. A substance is a principle and a cause, right? We might ask why a man is this sort of animal. Um, here then we're not, uh, we are clearly not asking why something that is a man is a man. We're asking why one thing belongs to another. And this is sort of important, right? So when we investigate being, we're not asking why is being being. We're asking really the question of belonging. That is, what exactly belongs with being? And what belongs with these particular beings, these primary substances? So I think it's sort of interesting here. And, I, and I, personally, myself, I've been thinking the idea that I think we could toy around with the idea that in a certain sense, Aristotle gives us a metaphysics of belonging. Right? That is, um, his ontology here ultimately is related to the idea of how things belong to each other. Right? Uh, and evidently then, if we want to understand belonging, we want to understand the causes. And here it's important to remember we're talking about the four causes. Right? Efficient, material, formal, and final cause. Um, and that as we search for this cause, we're looking for the essence. Now, what is the essence? Out of all the types of causes, the essence consists in the substantial form. And so that's sort of the takeaway here, is the substantial form business, um, in terms of what Aristotle is up to. Now, there's not too much more here in the passage that I want to talk about, but I'm going to show you a couple other things. He says, finally, instead of speaking without qualification, we must articulate our question before we search, since otherwise we'll not have distinguished a genuine search from a search for nothing. Uh, and so it's really important here that as you are reading, thinking about these issues, and as you are producing your own philosophy here, is methodologically, we should articulate what our questions are, so that way we're not just looking for nothing in the dark. And, I'll, and, and I'm not going to end the video here, but I'll end my sort of close reading of Aristotle here with this. He says, now this is the substance of a given thing, for this is the primary cause of the thing's being, what it is. Some things are not substances. But the things that are substances are naturally constituted. Hence, it can be a science. Hence, this nature, the one that is not an element but a principle, right? Remember, what is an element? An element concerns, for Aristotle, it's, you know, fire, earth, air, water, all this sort of stuff. But think about our elements, right? Think about helium, hydrogen, carbon, right? Our elements tell us the composition of matter. That's not what we're after. We don't care about the elements of the matter. We care about the elements of the form. And that signifies a principle. Uh, it signifies a certain principle of being. And it would appear from this text that every primary substance has, is in a certain way, it's, has within it its own principle. Um, and that principle is what is of ontological or metaphysical value. Now, continue on with the text, right? Um, is not an element, but a principle will, appar will apparently be substance. An element is what is present in something as the matter into which it is divided. Okay, that's actually the end of this, this section of the reading, book seven. And you can see here, Aristotle is doing a whole bunch of different things. I hope that what I've done here explains some of it. I'm almost certain that some of what I've said here is insufficient. And you're still going to need to continue reading the text. I do want to point out one thing, and this comes from the in Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, when they're talking about the role and the relationship between substances and universals, from this section, from this book in Aristotle's text, we have a problem. It looks like we can say is that at the core of it, we get these primary propositions. Substance is form. Form is universal but no universal is a substance, right? And so the question here is how can we understand this? Uh, and there's actually a huge amount of debate. In fact, um, this author contends that this is probably the most debated point uh, of interpretation for all of Aristotle's metaphysics. How can the form be universal, but yet there is no universal, um, there is no, no universal is itself a substance. Now, that's an important point. From my own way of thinking, I think that when we distinguish between the real and the nominal, we're able to actually deal with that difficulty myself. Now, this is my own interpretation, so please, please do not take this as authoritative or even representative 
of what a good Aristotelian scholar might say, right? But I kind of think it makes sense, which is namely this, is that it looks like that when we talk about substances being real, they have to be particular, right? But it looks like that our knowledge, that is our nominal conception of the real, always concerns the universal. And so the idea here is that we can't go backwards, right? The universal doesn't tell me about the real. Um, the particulars do. Uh, no, 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 I said that wrong, right? The universal is not something that's real, right? Um, and the particular is not something that's nominal, right? And I think this sort of helps understand, at least that's how I understand what Aristotle is doing here. Uh, but take a look here at the Stanford Psychopy of Philosophy and take a look at some of the other articles and how different philosophers have interpreted this, right? And I think wisely, as this author writes, it'd be foolish to attempt to resolve this issue within the confines of the present entry. And so too, I think it's probably foolish to try to resolve this in our reading right now of what Aristotle says. But hopefully, as you continue to evolve your own understanding, um, you may come to your own interpretation to resolve these issues. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate your time, and I'm sorry this runs over. It's really interesting stuff. Thanks a lot. See you guys online.